Hello, welcome to some video notes. This is on the second part of the reveal unit. So today we're going to be looking at the concepts of some specific equations. And so we'll be looking at uh, basically some core equations built around reactions with acids. And so uh, essentially you would have been able to do an experiment where you would be mixing uh, different types of chemicals, either pure elements or different salts uh, or um, some other um, carbonates and things like that. You would have mixed them with uh, different types of acids and then you would have tested for a product, a specific type of product, uh, specifically looking at whether or not hydrogen gas is produced in which you would do something called a squeaky pop test to see if hydrogen gas is present or carbon dioxide is produced um, in which you'd use lime water to test if carbon dioxide is present. And in either way, uh, you would be looking at, uh, well, you will be looking at some specific equations that are very important for thinking about how uh, different types of materials react with acids. Uh, doing types of chemical reactions. So today we'll be looking at these types of reactions of metals and carbonates with these acids. We'll be thinking about what type of reactants end up making products and how when we think of a word equation and a chemical equation, thinking about the fact that the atoms in the reactants, they have to go somewhere, right? They can't just disappear so they have to end up inside of the products. So if you think about what atoms, what materials you have as reactants, you can know what types of products you should be able to make uh, doing some simple tests. And then once you've confirmed you know, one of the products, you can make a really good educated guess on what the other product must be. So for example, if you know hydrogen gas is produced, well, then the, uh, the remaining product must be made up of the atoms that are left over. If you created water and carbon dioxide, and then you still have some other atoms left over in the reactants, then they must have come together to create maybe some type of salt that ends up as a product as well. So we're looking at those different uh, ways we can think of reactants and then ultimately what products uh, get produced from this. And then again, we'll begin, uh, we'll keep practicing this idea of using word equations and how to write word equations. And ultimately we're getting more into chemical equations uh, with the next unit, part three of the unit. Okay, so if you remember the character, uh, he used a key to get into the Pyro Fortress and then you guys help him solve the keypad door problem uh, in order to think of when an acid and an alkali are mixed together and it creates a neutralization reaction, right? And that in acids would be things <coughs> that have um, non-metal materials inside, like non-metal oxides, and alkalis would be solutions that have metal um, oxides inside of them. And so if you mix them together, they neutralize each other, that creates a pH of seven, uh, and that would all solving that riddle that opened that door. So then he opened the door, right? He got into another lab with some other clues and some other equipment, and of course, another door that he has to deal with, right? And so this one is a little perplexing. You can see that he's a little uh, freaked out a little bit because it's not as easy or doesn't seem as easy as the one we saw earlier, right? It's way more complicated. It's basically what we seem to have is a vessel with some liquid, and lock is behind some type of light that is shining through this liquid. And so in order to, uh, to get this unlocked, right, there's this special clue that seems to be um, burned into the side of the door, maybe using some type of chemistry. And said, if you, uh, if you would this door unlock, the ray of light need to be blocked, but you cannot touch the light. You use the clue to get it right. It's magic, so without a doubt, an alchemist will work it out. So it's basically saying if you really under chem understand chemistry, understand the, the real science behind all this stuff, what you're going to need to do is do some type of chemical reaction that's going to cause a light uh, inside of a special chamber to be blocked. And then once that light is no longer si shining onto a special sensor, the door is going to be able to unlock. And so if you actually want to look at a setup something like this, all right, so we've got down here, we've got a special circuit, a light detecting circuit. There's a light bulb up here, right? And this is all set inside of the wall behind some glass. So you can't really, you can't reach in and touch it, right? It's, it's, it's all uh, inside of the wall. And so the light is now shining down through this liquid, which is inside of a, a glass container between them. Uh, and as the light is able to hit the sensor, the, the, the circuit is complete basically. And so the door is going to remain locked. And so we have this, this liquid, this clear water right here. 
uh, and then we've got a tube running out of it. And so you're able to interact with this mouthpiece with this tube. And so you have to figure out what is something I can do in order to get this water to change color so that it's possible that the light cannot make it through the water uh, as easily or maybe at all. Uh, and so that will stop the lock from being uh, activated. And so then the door will open, right? So we've got this set up here. And then we've also got this weird yellow clue wheel thing. All right, and so this is going through more of the mechanics of it. Okay, so I think uh, if you, you really want to go through this, you can pause it if you want, but it's just kind of going through the, uh, the setup of the, the room itself, right? But basically the puzzle is we have to get the light to be blocked so that it can actually open the door. Okay, and so the other thing is we have a clue wheel, which looks like this. And so unfortunately, you guys aren't getting to have uh, these lessons in person because we actually have these things. And so you can kind of mess around with it as we go through the activity and see if you can figure it out as we go. And so this is a special clue wheel. And so what it actually is, it is a yellow disc on top of a white disc. And so the yellow disc has a piece missing here so that you can see some of the white disc underneath. And so for example, in the starting position, you can see these words on the white disc underneath. It says, Clue, an alchemist will put the words of the spell uh, in the correct order in order to reveal the answer. And so here we've got different stuff on our clue wheel. We've got phosphoric acid, right? So an acid containing phosphorus. Calcium chloride, which is a salt made of calcium and chlorine atoms. Uh, regular calcium, which is you know, just a metal. Uh, we have our adding sign and our reaction arrow, right? Calcium phosphate, right? So a compound made of calcium, phosphorus. And you know ATE means that there also there's oxygen present. So that's calcium, phosphorus, and oxygen. Remember all that stuff from other units, it's all coming back uh, in this unit as well. And then of course we have hydrogen, meaning hydrogen gas. And so this orange uh, set of clues is actually mapping out a very specific chemical reaction. And so if we can determine what's the correct order to think about this chemical reaction, we might be able to know the answer to a secret chemical reaction, which is hidden on the white disc underneath uh, the yellow disc. And so eventually we'll get to that in, uh, in just a second. But um, uh, before we get into that, we have to think about, well, what could this reaction that we're looking at on the, the reaction wheel, what does it mean? What is it referring to? And then what is a way that we could find an alternative way to think about this reaction, right? So the clue wheel is great because it gives him an idea of the type of spell he needs to do. And the spell seems to be doing some type of chemical reaction. Possibly he could be using uh, calcium, he could be using phosphoric acid, and he could react them together and see if he can get uh, phosphor, um, calcium phosphate, maybe hydrogen gas, maybe calcium chloride, right? So maybe some of those things on the wheel are reactants and some of them are products. And he just needs to figure out which ones are reactants and which ones are products in order to know what their reaction actually is. However, if, the, if you just mix those things up together, you're not really gonna necessarily get the best idea because if you look at the supplies in the room, none of the chemicals that are on the wheel are actually present, right? So if the chemistry wheel says you need to use phosphoric acid, there's no phosphoric acid in the room. It says you need to use calcium, but there's no calcium in the room. It says you might have calcium chloride, but there's no calcium chloride in the room. And so this becomes a problem, right? And so then this comes back to that core idea, which I've brought up a couple of times throughout these units. There are core equations in chemistry. And if we understand those core equations, we can substitute in different materials and we should still be able to pr predict the products that would come out of it, right? Just like that idea with metals reacting with oxygen creates a metal oxide. It doesn't matter what metal it is, we always make a metal oxide. If it's a non-metal reacting with oxygen, it makes a non-metal oxide, regardless of what type of non-metal we're talking about. So even though we don't have calcium, we might have a different metal that we could be using. Even though we don't have phosphoric acid, maybe we can be using a different acid and we can still get the same type of products because we're following these general equations, okay? So that's where our hero's thinking. He's gonna look around the room and see what type of materials he has available. And so this is what you guys would have done in class. So on this page here in your packets, so you can find it real quick, right? We've got these chemicals available to us. See the available chemical box, right? 
nitric acid, sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, magnesium, zinc, iron, magnesium chloride, calcium sulfate, and zinc nitrate. And then here we've got the materials that are on our clue wheel. We've got phosphoric acid, we've got calcium phosphate, we've got hydrogen, calcium chloride, and just regular calcium, right? So then what I want you to do is I want you, eventually you're going to pause this, and I want you to put in a description in your notes of what this material is from the spell, and then which of the alternative chemicals could we possibly be using instead of that chemical? Because we don't actually have these ones on the side, on the left side. So what are alternative ones that we could be using? So in the description, I want you to be using stuff like this, right? Is it an element or is it a compound? If it's an element, is it a metal or is it a nonmetal? If it's a compound, is it an acid, is it an alkali, is it a neutral salt, okay? So what I want you to do, pause the video, try working this out on your own, all right? And then unpause it, all right? You did all that work, okay? So then let's go through some of these answers, right? So phosphoric acid, obviously that is a compound and it's gonna be acidic, it's right there in the name, right? Acid, all right? And, and we think of things that would be similar to this, probably would be all of the other acids. Nitric acid, sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid. They're all compounds and they're all going to be acids, right? So that would be a good substitution. So maybe we don't need to use phosphoric acid in our experiment, we just need to be using one of the other acids instead. Uh, then we have calcium phosphate. And we think of calcium phosphate, it's also a compound. Uh, it will be alkali uh, when it mixes with material because uh, it could be broken down. Uh, and then it's also going to be a salt, right? Uh, and so salt means it's something that's made of a metal and a non-metal mixed together. So it would be con constituted as a salt. And then other materials we could be using instead of this, possibly other compounds that are similar to it, maybe magnesium chloride or calcium sulfate, or maybe nitric add, or zinc nitrates. Right? Those are all compounds. They are also all salts. And so we might be able to get a similar reaction with them as well. Uh, hydrogen gas, right? Uh, description is that it's an element. Uh, it's a non-metal. And you can be even more specific that it's, it is a gas. It's normally found in the gas form. Uh, in terms of our available chemicals, though, we don't have anything, right? There's nothing in those available chemicals there uh, that represents a gas, a non-metal gas which is interesting because that means that possibly hydrogen is not going to be a reactant. It's definitely going to be a product, right? It's not something that we're gonna have and we're gonna add to our reaction. It's something that we don't have and that we're going to produce as a new product when we do our chemical reaction. So we can be pretty sure that hydrogen gas in our reaction is going to be a product, okay? Then we have calcium chloride, right? Calcium chloride, another compound, potentially alkali and being a salt as well. Again, our magnesium chloride. We could be thinking of the other ones as well, but magnesium chloride, calcium chloride, they're very, very similar to each other in terms of they're both being a chloride compound. So maybe magnesium chloride is even better of a substitution for it, right? And then our last one, pure calcium, that is going to be an element. It's going to be a metal. You could also say, say that it is a solid as well, right? And so we could think of magnesium, uh, iron, and zinc. Those are all uh, elements and they're all metals. And so possibly we could be substituting magnesium, iron, or zinc instead of using our calcium, okay? So then what we would be doing is you guys would take all of these available chemicals, right? And so this, these chemicals are gonna be available to you in the classroom. Uh, and so you would take these chemicals and you would test them. And you would see if I take iron and sulfuric acid and I mix them together, what do I get? If I take hydrochloric acid and I take zinc nitrate and I mix it together, uh, what do I get? And so if we look here, all right, at the, this page here, um, that's what you would have done, all right? You would have done a name of the acid, a name of a solid reactant, all right, that you would have mixed it together. So you would have actually, we actually wouldn't have um, nitric acid. We only had hydrochloric acid and sulfuric acid when we do this. So hyd hydrochloric acid or sulfuric acid, and then you would have taken a powder like pure zinc or um, mag um, Ugh, magnesium chloride. Uh, so you would have taken pure elements or you would have taken compounds. So you would have taken these powder materials and you would have mixed them together with these acids. 
you would think about the type of products that would be produced. And then in order to test for these products, you're actually testing for two different gases that get made, right? You're gonna be testing for uh, hydrogen gas, or you would be testing for uh, a car, uh, calcium, or sorry, carbon dioxide, right? So to do a hydrogen gas test would be to do a squeaky pop test, which basically means you take the container of the hydrogen gas that gets cr created, right? So you do your chemical reaction inside of your test tube, you let the gas build up inside of your test tube, and then you would just take a lit splint and you would put it into the test tube. And if hydrogen gas is inside, since hydrogen gas is very flammable, it's going to create like a little tiny, tiny little explosion. And so you're gonna make a poop pop sound, like a like poop, right, sound out of the test tube uh, when all of that hydrogen gas burns. Uh, if it was carbon dioxide, you guys should already remember what we would do, right? We would take carbon dioxide and we would bubble it through, you remember, right? We would bubble that gas through lime water. And in, if the lime water, which is normally clear, if carbon dioxide is present, then it's going to change to a cloudy white coloring, right? Because of the carbon dioxide. So you would have been able to do all these tests. And so this would have been a lime water test for carbon dioxide, right? So you would have been having the chemical reaction in one test tube, and then you would have had a, a, a rubber tube connecting the two test tubes together. And as the carbon dioxide was created, it would bubble through this lime water, and it would change from clear lime water to the cloudy white lime water. All right, and so you can see it's getting cloudier uh, as we add more and more carbon dioxide. And so here we can do uh, a comparison between the two. Here's the clear lime water when it's not reacted. Here's the cloudy lime water after it has reacted, right? And so the cloudy white coloring means that carbon dioxide must be being produced um, by the chemical reaction. Right? Squeaky pop test would look like this. Get a pop. As I slowed it down there, you can hear a little better. Nice high squeaky pop sound, right? And that pop sound is from burning the hydrogen gas. Okay? So if there was hydrogen gas present, you would have did this, and then you would see uh, a squeaky pop test. A positive test would be if it makes that sound. Okay? There also could have been a situation where there was no reaction. Just because we're mixing these materials together doesn't mean that they have to cause some type of chemical reaction. So really the first thing you were gonna do is you would first see, are there bubbles at all? Because if there are bubbles when you do the chemical reaction, well then you know that there is chemistry happening because a gas is being produced as a new product. Then you would do a squeaky pop test and you would do a, um, a carbon dioxide test to see whether or not hydrogen gas is present or carbon dioxide is present when you do those chemical reactions. Now, unfortunately, because of circumstances, you guys are not going to be present to do all of this. So you don't have to worry about filling out this page, right? But you did have a place to collect all of your results uh, here, right? And so these are all the materials you would have been able to work with. You would have had magnesium, iron, and zinc, magnesium chloride, potassium chloride, sodium chlorides, and then you would have these three carbonates sodium carbonate, magnesium carbonate, and zinc carbonate. And then there were two acids that you could have been testing with. You could have tested it with hydrochloric acid, and you could have tested it with sulfuric acid. And so what you basically would have to do is mix the material with one of the two acids, and you, take, you could take turns switching between the two different acids, and you would look to see, is there a reaction, right? So yes, there's a reaction, or no, there's a reaction. There is no reaction. And if there is a reaction, are we seeing hydrogen gas, H2, produce, or are we seeing CO2 produced, okay? So uh, in your note packets, you need to write these down. You're gonna, gonna go through what the results would have been. So if you had started with magnesium, for example, regardless of which acid you'd used, they both would have produced a positive squeaky pop test. So magnesium plus hydrochloric acid or magnesium plus sulfuric acid would have made hydrogen gas as one of the products. With iron, same thing, and also with zinc. And so you would see a nice little trend here that the pure metals, magnesium, iron, or zinc, they're all metal elements, right? If we take a pure metal and we mix it with an acid, it doesn't really matter which acid we have, right? We mix it, mix it with a nice strong acid, we will get hydrogen gas. It will take the hydrogen atoms from the acid, 
release them. And as they float into the air, as they move through the water, they create H2, which is the, H, the hydrogen gas. And then that hydrogen gas, we can you know, do a squeaky pop test to confirm that that gas is there by burning it and making that pop sound. So a metal plus an acid is going to produce hydrogen gas. There's some other stuff that gets made as well, but we definitely know hydrogen gas is getting produced. Then we would have moved on to some of our compounds, magnesium chloride, potassium chloride, sodium chloride, right? For all of these, the acids are going to produce no reaction. There's not gonna be any bubbles. There's not gonna be anything produced because really all that's going to happen is the magnesium chloride, potassium chloride, and sodium chlorides, these are all salts, right? And so they will just dissolve into the material, right? They're going to break apart. Uh, the powder material is just going to dissolve, just like it would in water, right? If we mix them with water, it would also dissolve. So in the acidic material, it's also going to dissolve, but it's not going to do any chemistry, right? The atoms are just going to break apart a little bit, but they're not going to be making any new products. And if I were to boil all the acid away, or if I boiled all the, yeah, if I boiled either of the acids away, eventually the magnesium chloride and potassium chloride and sodium chloride, it would all come back once we remove all the liquid material because it's only dissolving. It's not actually doing a chemical reaction, okay? So no reaction there. Then we move on to our carbonates. We have our sodium carbonate, <coughs> magnesium carbonate, and zinc carbonate. And for all of these, in acid, they would have produced a gas. And when we test that gas, we would have saw that it produced um, a, a carbon dioxide. It would have been a positive test for the lime water test. And the reason why it is producing that gas is because these elements, or sorry, these compounds are carbonates, carbonates. So remember that carbonates, right? Just like the ATE we've learned about in the first unit, that means oxygen is present. So carbonate is actually CO3. And so what happens when we mix a carbonate with acids, that CO3 gets broken down and some of the carbon and oxygen gets released as CO2. So carbonates, when they react with oxygens, create CO2, okay? And that CO2 gas leaves, and eventually if we take the CO2 gas and we bubble it through our lime water, that's gonna change from a clear coloring to a uh, opaque white coloring, and so that's how we know carbon dioxide is present. So from these sets of reactions, you would have come across with these two important results. Metals plus acids is going to release hydrogen gas. Carbonates plus acid will release CO2 gas, okay? So these are parts of the really important core equations that we're gonna continue on. So there's some other things we're gonna learn about. So this is just the very beginning of this idea, these core equations. So if you need to, uh, you can pause this if you need to, to write some of this stuff down. But if you're ready, uh, let's go and do some notes to talk about uh, these types of reactions, what's actually happening with these different types of reactions, all right? So the main character is like, wait a minute, I'm seeing this trend, and then I'm also connecting that to my wheel, right? So I'm seeing a pattern with those chemical reactions, and I see a pattern here with my wheel, my, the wheel here, right? We have an acid, like phosphoric acid, right? We have a metal, calcium is a metal, and we have two salts. We have phos uh, calcium phosphate, which is a salt, then we have calcium chloride, which is a salt, and we also get hydrogen gas. And right off the bat, I think you guys are probably starting to realize that one of the things on this reaction wheel has no use, right? And hopefully you're starting to realize that if we're talking about adding metals and acids to get hydrogen gas, the other thing that must get created is a salt, right? That forms from that compound. So here, phosphoric acid, if we react it with calcium, which is a metal, we're going to get hydrogen gas. But that phosphorus and that calcium has to go somewhere. It just doesn't disappear. It's going to form a new compound. It's going to form the salt calcium phosphate, right? Phosphoric acid becomes phosphate, a phosphorus with some oxygens attached to it, and the calcium reacts with it to form a new compound called calcium phosphate. So phosphoric acid and calcium are our reactants, and hydrogen gas and calcium phosphate are our products. That means this guy here, calcium chloride, it doesn't serve any purpose in our chemical reaction. 
because the calcium doesn't react with chloride because there is no chloride in the reactant side. If it's calcium, uh, sorry, phosphoric acid plus calcium, right, there is no chloride on the reactant side. So on the product side, there can't be anything that contains chloride because chloride isn't there to begin with when we start the reaction. So calcium chloride seems like it's a non-important part of the wheel. It's just there to throw you off. It's a fake clue. It's just there to confuse you. And that actually the reaction that we're looking at is phosphoric acid plus calcium reaction wheel will produce calcium phosphate and hydrogen gas. A metal plus an acid produces hydrogen gas plus a salt made of the atoms that are left over. And so that's where we're gonna get into some of our big notes. Acids, all right, neutralized by a compound, end up creating a salt and releasing some hydrogen gas, right? So it ends up creating a more neutral compound. It loses the acidity because it loses that hydrogen that causes it to be an acid. So a metal plus an acid creates a salt plus hydrogen gas. This is your core equation. You must know this equation because then we can give you different metals, we can give you different acids, and you can know what salt and what, and the fact that hydrogen gas is also gonna be made. I could give you the hydrogen gas, and I could give you the salt, and you could go the other direction. You could tell me what metal and what acid was used in order to make that salt and the hydrogen gas. So you really have to know this core equation because we can give you all these different types of examples using the different elements on the periodic table and make a lot of different types of questions for you when the test comes up. All right, so this is our general equation. Now we want to look at some specific equations that show the different types of salts that get made depending on the different types of acids that are used. All right, so if our general equation is metal plus acid <coughs> gives us a salt and hydrogen, depending on what salt and what acid or what type of acid we use, sorry, it tells us what type of salt we're going to get. So let's, for example, let's go through each one of the acids we've been talking about. Hydrochloric acid. If we take magnesium, which is a metal, and we take hydrochloric acid, which is an acid, we should make a salt plus hydrogen gas. If the hydrogen gas came from here, that's the hydro part of hydrochloric, right? So the hydro part disappears. We're left over with magnesium, which is a metal, and chlorine. The chloric part is chlorine, Cl, right? So that means the products of this reaction have to be magnesium chloride, right? The compound of magnesium plus chlorine makes magnesium chloride plus hydrogen gas, right? Because we know hydrogen gas is a product. This is why we talked about this idea that unit one and unit two are super important, right? You have to really know your naming rules so that you know that, well, if I take chloric acid and I take the Cl out of it, which is chlorine in the element, it becomes chloride when it matches with magnesium, which is the metal. So you need to know how metals and nonmetals and all the different naming rules that apply when we're dealing with compounds. Now you're really going to be tested with this stuff. So this is also our general rule. When we're thinking about our acids and our salts, right? Reactants and products are gonna be really related to each other, right? So here, if we're talking about uh, hydrochloric acid, for example, uh, the example I just showed you, <coughs> it might be a little bit easier to visualize it. If I showed it to you instead of a word equation, I showed you the chemical equation. So there's different ways equations form. We have the general equation, with a general thing like metal, acid, salt, hydrogen. A word equation, which is uses the specific elements, magnesium or specific compounds like hydrochloric acid. But then we also have the symbol equation or formula, all right, for that chemical reaction. Here, Mg represents our magnesium. We reacted it with HCl, which is hydrochloric acid. Hydro meaning hydrogen, chloric meaning Cl, chlorine. So HCl is hydrochloric acid and it produces magnesium chloride, MgCl2, plus hydrogen gas, H2. And of course, we're gonna come up to this again when we get to part three of the unit, we are balancing this as well. That's why this two is here. Two times H, 
two times CL. We need to do that because on the product side, there are two CLs here, CL2, right? So that means double the number of CLs. And there are two hydrogens. H2 means there's double the number of hydrogens. So we need to put this two in front of hydrochloric acid to make the equation balanced. Okay, so if we follow the general, the word, or the symbol equation, right, depending on how specific you're being asked to be, you need to make sure that you're following the directions. You might be asked a general equation. You might be asked a, to write a word equation. You might be asked to write a symbol equation. The thing is to make sure that you're following the directions inside the question. All right, if it's asking for the chemical formula, you need to be using the numbers and the letters. If it asks for a word equation, you need to full vocabulary. If we talk about a general equation, then maybe you just need to be very, very general with the way it talks about it. So be very clear about what you need to be putting down based on what the question asks you. Now, under this idea of metal plus acid produces salt and hydrogen gas, we can look at different examples. So there are patterns that appear. Depending on the type of acid, we get different types of salts at the end. So let's talk about sulfuric acid. Let's keep magnesium. Let's keep using magnesium as our metal. Sulfuric acid plus magnesium, right? So what would be the products of this? Acid plus a metal means we get hydrogen gas and a salt. So hydrogen is coming from sulfuric acid, right? So that is where the hydrogen comes from. If we're going to make a salt, magnesium is going to be the metal, right? So it's magnesium. So then if it's sulfuric acid, what do sulfuric acids produce? They produce sulfates. So remember, sulfates, sulfur, which is S, right? And eight means that we have oxygen present as well. So we actually have magnesium sulfur and oxygen in this salt compound and we also produce hydrogen gas. So you also should be remembering these more specific examples. Sulfuric acids, when they react with metals, will make sulfates plus hydrogen gas, right? Whatever the metal is plus sulfate plus the hydrogen gas. So that's our word equation. We could also look at it as a chemical equation. Sulfuric acid is H2SO4 right? And you should start memorizing these equations because it will make chemistry a lot easier for you. One of the ways you can remember the uh, chemical formula for H2SO4 is a little poem. It says, little Timmy took a drink, but he will drink no more because what he thought was H2O was H2SO4. So H2O would be water. So he thought he was drinking water, but he didn't drink H2O. He, he took a drink of h 2 SO4, which is sulfuric acid, right? So instead of drinking water, he drank acid, and that's why he can't drink anymore because he killed, he died from drinking acid. But that little poem, maybe that can help you remember, sulfuric acid is H2SO4. So we can see that the oxygens and the sulfur, they stay together, right? The hydrogen breaks away, creating hydrogen gas, and the magnesium and the sulfates, SO4, right? they come together to rate magnesium sulfate, right? So making our salt and making hydrogen gas. <laughs> so that's sulfuric acids create sulfates. If we looked at, for example, here, uh, hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid, we've already did an example of this. It makes chlorides, right? Hydrochloric acid plus magnesium, right? We already did this as an earlier one on the slide. The hydrogen gas is coming from the acid. The chloric is really chlorine. So magnesium plus chlorine makes magnesium chloride and hydrogen, right? And this is going to be the chemical equation. HCl is the equation for hydrochloric acid. Again, you should memorize that. It will make it easier for you. Uh, and reacting with magnesium makes MgCl2 and hydrogen gas, okay? So hydrochloric acids make chlorides. Just like sulfuric acid makes sulfates, right? Hydrochloric acid makes chlorides. So you memorize these patterns so that you understand when to apply them when they come up on a test. And one more example is our nitric acids. So nitric acids make our nitrates. So here, nitric acid plus magnesium, you probably already figured it out at this point, right? We're going to produce magnesium nitrate, so the nitric acid becomes nitrate and hydrogen gas. 
Now again, this might make a little bit more sense if we look at this at a formula level. So here is what it looks like, right? We have HNO3, which again, it will make it easier for you if you memorize that as the equation for nitric acid, right? HNO3 plus magnesium. So the hydrogen gets released, creating hydrogen gas. And then we get Mg parentheses NO3 2. Now, this is something we will talk about a little bit more when we get to the third part of this unit about balancing equations. But these parentheses here, it's just like a math equation, all right, before. It's just the way they work in math as well. So remember that the three here next to this oxygen means that there's three times the number of oxygen. So there's three oxygen, right? Here, the two next to this hydrogen means that there's two hydrogens, right? Two times H, right? So NO3, right, with the parentheses, this two means two times just NO3, just the material that's inside of the parentheses. So that's actually two times N. So there's two Ns, which works because there's two Ns over here. And that's two times three oxygens. So two times three oxygens means that there's six oxygens, which works because if you look over here, two HNO3, that's two times H, two times N, two times HO3, or O3. So that means two times O3, that means a total of six oxygens as well. So our equation is nice and balanced, right? Two hydrogens, two hydrogens, two nitrogens, two nitrogens, six oxygens, six oxygens. So both sides of the equation balance out for the same number of elements. Also the magnesium, one and one for the magnesium, right? Okay, so moving forward, nitric acids, all right, produces our nitrates. Again, try to keep this organized in your brain. All right, so then now we're gonna go through a couple of practice problems that I help apply this. So if you feel a little bit unsure, uh, pause this, Go back, look at some of your notes a little bit, maybe watch a little part of the video again. Uh, but I really want you to challenge yourself. You should try to do these on your own before I show you the answers. Okay, so look at this page, page 13. This is some naming practice, right? So let's make sure we understand how to do appropriate naming. So we have different acids, sulfuric, nitric, hydrochloric, right, on the sides. Different compounds are gonna be mixed with it, right? and you need to name the salt, just the salt that's gonna be produced, not the gas, just the salt, okay? All right, so you did this. All right, so the first example, sulfuric acid plus magnesium, well, that makes magnesium sulfates. Sulfurics make sulfates. Sulfuric plus calcium, well, it still applies. Different metal, but the same idea. We get calcium sulfates. Sulfurics make sulfates. Nitric acid creating, reacting with zinc carbonates ends up making zinc nitrate and also carbon dioxide, right? Because it's a carbonate. So zinc nitrate, right? If we have nitric acid plus magnesium carbonate, even though we're using a different compound, we're still getting the same type of reaction. So we should get magnesium nitrate, right? Nitric acids make nitrates. And then of course, we'd also have CO2 made as a gas. Hydrochloric acid plus iron makes iron chloride, right? So hydrochloric acid plus zinc, well, that must make zinc chloride, right? And also both of these would release hydrogen gas, H2. Sulfuric acid plus copper, copper carbonate makes copper sulfate, right? And the carbonate also makes CO2. So copper sulfates, sulfurics make sulfates. Nitric acid plus sodium carbonate, right? That would make sodium nitrate because nitrics make nitrates. And of course, carbonate means more CO2 gets released. Hydrochloric acid plus zinc carbonate means we would get zinc chloride because hydrochlorics make chlorides. And again, CO2 because carbonates will release CO2. And then sulfuric acid plus zinc carbonate means we get zinc sulfate because sulfurics make sulfates, right? And then uh, of course, CO2 as well because again, carbonates make CO2. So hopefully this wasn't too difficult for you, but you're seeing this pattern. So if you remember the rules, the general equation rules, and then some of the specific ones, like what happens with hydrochloric acid, what happens with sulfuric acid, what happens with nitric acid, 
then it, we can give you lots of different metals and different compounds to react with, but you already know what the products should be because you understand the rules of chemistry. Okay, so any acid and a metal is going to follow this pattern. Metal plus acid makes our salt plus hydrogen gas, right? So he thinks he knows the order on the dial. I think you guys know the order on the dial as well, right? And so here we're going to do this first part and then we're going to move on to the second part. So the first part here, just this upper part, let's think about this, right? Uh, on our dial, we have phosphoric acid, calcium phosphate, hydrogen gas, calcium and calcium chloride. And so I want you to fill this out real quick. Is it a reactant? Is it a product or is it neither? All right. So what are the reactants and what are the products for our mystery dial, right? The orange disc that I showed you. All right. So you did this part first, just this upper part, right? So that means phosphoric acid. Well, that's our acid. So that's going to be a reactant, right? Calcium phosphate. Phosphate came from phosphoric acid. So calcium phosphate is a salt made with that acid. So that's going to be a product. Hydrogen gas, we know, is a product. And a metal mixed with an acid is going to make hydrogen gas. Calcium is our metal. So that means it must be a reactant. And then we know that calcium chloride is neither because we're not dealing with hydrochloric acid. So we shouldn't make a chloride using <coughs> phosphoric acid. We could only make a chloride if we we're dealing with hydrochloric acid. So calcium chloride can't exist. It can't have come from anywhere because we don't have the reactants to make it. So it's not a reactant and it's not a product. So it's neither. And then if we were going to write out this equation here, right, we would say that we're doing phosphoric acid plus calcium, acid plus metal, creates our salts, calcium phosphate, phosphorics make phosphates, and that put in uh, hydrogen gas as our product. Okay? So this is our first part of our page 14. So then let's look at our reaction wheel. Okay? So here's our reaction wheel. All right? So the white part will show us the secret code as long as we put the orange part in the right position. Okay? So if we turn our reaction wheel, let's start with phosphoric acid. We turn it to phosphoric acid and it shows us hydrochloric acid. So instead of phosphoric acid, we need to use hydrochloric acid. So that's our first reactant, hydrochloric acid. Then we need to react it, right? So we use a plus sign that shows us and. So hydrochloric acid and, right? We want to use a metal. So we turn it to calcium. And for calcium, the secret message shows calcium carbonate. So it wants us to use hydrochloric acid and calcium carbonate. Those are our reactants for the secret reaction that we need to be doing. Then we have our reaction arrow, right? And the reaction arrow, the word is produces. So hydrochloric acid uh, and calcium carbonates will produce or produces, right? If we do this correct, calcium, or sorry, phosphoric acid reacting with calcium should make the salt um, calcium phosphate and hydrogen gas. So we can start with hydrogen gas. So if we turn it to hydrogen gas, the clue wheel shows a gas, which makes sense, right? So a gas. And then if we turn it to and, it says, which turns the liquid, okay? And then if we turn it to calcium phosphate, it says cloudy. So that means if we put all those words in order, it's saying hydrochloric acid plus calcium carbonate produces a gas which turns the liquid cloudy, right? So that secret message and the special white disc underneath is telling us what we need to do. If we want to make the liquid inside of the special lock on our door, if we want to make it so that it blocks the light, we just need to mix hydrochloric acid and calcium carbonate together. And we already know that if we mix the acid, hydrochloric acid, with a carbonate, that's going to produce carbon dioxide. And so if the carbon dioxide gas goes into the water and then the water changes to a cloudy white coloring, that's not regular water inside, that's lime water. So we're doing a reaction that produces carbon dioxide gas so that it will react with lime water in order to block the light. And so that's how we're going to open the door, right? So back on page 14, we can write down our ideas, right? So this is the, uh, the <coughs> reaction that we're going to be doing. Hydrochloric acid is going to react with calcium carbonate. That's going to produce calcium chloride, right? Chloric acids make chlorides. 
and a gas. Specifically, it's going to be making carbon dioxide, which is the gas that we need in order to <coughs> um, block the light. And the reason why this will work is carbon dioxide will react with lime water and lime water will turn into a cloudy solution. So the light cannot get through the water very easily. And so eventually the sensor doesn't detect the light very well and the door is going to open. All right, so if you need this again, you can pause this, right? So moving on. So our hero's like, I got it, right? That's what we're gonna do. Inside this container, we have hydrochloric acid. He dumps in some calcium carbonate. He connects the, the flask to a tube that's gonna feed any carbon dioxide gas. The carbon dioxide gas is gonna get produced. It's gonna travel up this tube. And then look, it's gonna go into this water and change it to a white uh, cloudy chain, a cloudy mixture. And because of that, right, the door is going to open because the light is no longer getting through the cloud and getting through the, the liquid very easily. So the sensor can't pick up the light. And so the door ends up unlocking. Okay, so we've figured it out. So just a little bit <coughs> more revision. Here on page 14, you've got some more practice. So here, uh, thinking about these word equations. So make sure we're following the directions, right? So here, we're thinking about how can we organize these vocabulary words below so that we have a reaction that, does, uh, that releases hydrogen gas, one that releases carbon dioxide gas, and then one that releases energy as hydrogen burns, all right? This hydrogen burns, think of combustion. So you can pause the video, right? So you tried this out, good. So using the vocabulary, and we're using all these vocabulary words just once, okay? So then how can we do a reaction that releases hydrogen gas? Well, you remember at this point, you hope you've learned that a metal plus an acid is going to produce hydrogen gas and a salt. So if we wanna produce hydrogen gas, we need to be using an acid and a metal. So we need to be picking acids and metals that are linked to each other based on the type of acid we use versus the type of salt that we're going to get out of this, right? And so we might have something like this. If we had hydrochloric acid plus nickel as our metal, we could get nickel chloride because chloric acids make chlorides and could make hydrogen gas for us, right? So this would be a good reaction to producing hydrogen gas. If we wanted to make carbon dioxide gas, well, that means we need to be using a carbonate specifically. So it can't just be a metal by itself. It has to be a metal that is with a carbonate. But then the acid that we use and the carbonate that we use have to be logical so that they make an actual salt that would really exist, plus the carbon dioxide gas. So this would be sulfuric acid, plus tin carbonate would produce tin sulfate because sulfurics make sulfates and carbon dioxide and also water. So there's also an addition when we do these chemical reactions, water is also produced by carbonates. Uh, but of course we don't really test for, for water because uh, it's, it's in the solution. But water also gets produced when we react carbonates with acids. And then for releasing energy as hydrogen burns, well, if we're going to be doing something where stuff is reacting with hydrogen. Hydrogen is burning, right? Burning means we need to do fire triangle. It means we need oxygen. So that sounds like we're taking pure hydrogen and reacting it with oxygen. And so if hydrogen and oxygen react with each other, what do you get? You get water, right? You get H2O. So hydrogen and oxygen, right? The burning of hydrogen in the presence of oxygen doing a combustion reaction should create H2O, should create water. All right, so hopefully this wasn't uh, too difficult to figure out. All right, so the door is open for our hero. The lime water went cloudy, all right, it blocks the light, and now he's through the door. And so we are one step closer to helping him out and helping him find his friends and free them. Okay, so uh, that is it for this, and if you have any questions, let me know.